A reading from the book of the prophet Daniel. In Babylon, there lived a man named Joachim, who married a very beautiful and God-fearing woman, Susanna, the daughter of Hilkiah. Her pious parents had trained their daughter according to the law of Moses. Joachim was very rich. He had a garden near his house, and the Jews had recourse to him often because he was the most respected of them all. That year, two elders of the people were appointed judges, of whom the Lord said, Wickedness has come out of Babylon, from the elders who were to govern the people as judges. These men to whom all brought their cases frequented the house of Joachim. When the people left at noon, Susanna used to enter her husband's garden for a walk. When the old men saw her enter every day for her walk, they began to lust for her. They suppressed their consciences. They would not allow their eyes to look to heaven and did not keep in mind just judgments. One day, while they were waiting for the right moment, she entered the garden as usual with two maids only. She decided to bathe for the weather was warm. Nobody else was there except the two elders who had hidden themselves and were watching her. Bring me oil and soap, she said to the maids, and shut the garden doors while I bathe. As soon as the maids had left, the two old men got up and hurried to her. Look, they said, the garden doors are shut and no one can see us. Give in to our desire and lie with us. If you refuse, we will testify against you that you dismissed your maids because a young man was here with you. I'm completely trapped, Susanna groaned. If I yield to you, it will be my death. If I refuse, I cannot escape your power. Yet it is better for me to fall into your power without guilt than to sin before the Lord. Then Susanna shrieked, and the old men also shouted at her as one of them ran to open the garden doors. When the people in the house heard the cries from the garden, they rushed in by the side of the gate to see what had happened to her. At the accusations by the old men, the servants felt very much ashamed, for never had any such thing been said about Susanna. When the people came to her husband, Joachim, the next day, the two wicked elders also came, fully determined to put Susanna to death. Before all the people they ordered, send for Susanna, the daughter of Hilkiah, the wife of Joachim. When she was sent for, she came with her parents, children, and all her relatives. All her relatives and the onlookers were weeping. In the midst of the people, the two elders rose up and laid their hands on her, on her head. Through tears, she looked up to heaven, for she trusted in the Lord wholeheartedly. The elders made this accusation. As we were walking in the garden alone, this woman entered with two girls and shut the doors of the garden, dismissing the girls. A young man who was hidden there came and lay with her. When we in a corner of the garden saw this crime, we ran toward them. We saw them lying together, but the man we could not hold because he was stronger than we. He opened the doors and ran off. Then we seized her and asked who the young man was, but she refused to tell us. We testify to this. The assembly believed them since they were elders and judges of the people and they, they condemned her to death. But Susanna cried aloud, O eternal God, you know what is hidden and are aware of all things before they come to be. You know that they have testified falsely against me. Here I am about to die, though I have done none of the things with which the wicked men have charged me. The Lord heard her prayer. As she was being led to execution, God stirred up the Holy Spirit of a young boy named Daniel, and he cried aloud, I will have no part in the death of this woman. All the people turned and asked him, 
What is this you are saying? He stood in their midst and continued, Are you such fools, O children of Israel, to condemn a woman of Israel without examination and without clear evidence? Return to court, for they have testified falsely against her. Then all the people returned in haste. To Daniel the elder said, Come sit with us and inform us, since God has given you the prestige of old age. But he replied, Separate these two far from each other, that I may examine them. After they were separated one from the other, he called one of them and said, How you have grown evil with age. Now have your past sins come to term, passing unjust sentences, condemning the innocent and freeing the guilty. Although the Lord says, The innocent and the just you shall not put to death. Now then, if you are a witness, tell me, under what tree you saw them together? Under a mastic tree, he answered. Daniel replied, Your fine lie has cost you your head, for the angel of God shall receive the sentence from him and split you in two. Putting him to one side, he ordered the other one to be brought. Daniel said to him, Offspring of Canaan, not of Judah, beauty has seduced you. Lust has subverted your conscience. This is how you acted with the daughters of Israel, and in their fear they yielded to you. But a daughter of Judah did not tolerate your wickedness. Now then, tell me under what tree you surprised them together. Under an oak tree, he said. Daniel replied, Your fine lie has cost you also your head, for the angel of God waits with the sword to cut you in two, so as to make an end of you both. The whole assembly cried aloud, Blessing God who saves those who hope in him. They rose up against the two elders, for by their own words Daniel had convicted them of perjury. According to the law of Moses, they inflicted on them the penalty they had plotted to impose on their neighbor. They put them to death. Thus was innocent blood spared on that day. Verbum Domini. Even though I walk in the va- even though I walk in the dark valley, I fear no evil, for you are at my side. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In verdant pastures he gives me repose. Beside restful waters he leads me. He refreshes my soul. He guides me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk in the dark valley, I fear no evil, for you are at my side with your rod and your staff that give me courage. Even though I walk in the dark valley, I fear no evil, for you are at my side. You spread the table before me in the sight of my foes. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Even though I walk in the dark valley, I fear no evil, for you are at my side. Only goodness and kindness follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for years to come. To 
Dominus Fobisco. Et Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Ioannem. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, but early in the morning he arrived again in the temple area, and all the people started coming to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and made her stand in the middle. They said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? They said this to test him, so that they could have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and began to write on the ground with his finger. But when they continued asking him, he straightened up and said to them, Let the one among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he bent down and wrote on the ground. And in response, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. So he was left alone with the woman before him. Then Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She replied, No one, sir. Then Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, do not sin any more. Ad bom do ad mini. Today's first reading shows us the real and true evil of the sins of rash judgment, the sins of detraction, and the sins of calumny or slander, gossip in its varying degrees, as the Catechism of the Catholic Church makes so clear in its own teachings, based on the constant teaching tradition of the Church. We see this in the judgment of Susanna and in the lying and the deceit wrought by the two elders who wanted to do wrong with her, and how Daniel, this young man, brought out truth in the whole situation and made truth reign supreme. We could say that because of Daniel, the first reading's theme is about judging in God's presence and light. And then in the gospel today, which was yesterday's gospel as well, for the fifth Sunday of Lent for year C, we have a truly, indeed, sinful person who did do wrong, unlike Susanna, who did no wrong. So we see a stark contrast between Susanna in her her innocence and the adulterous woman in her non-innocence. But yet in the gospel, we see Jesus' love and mercy condemning the sin, but not condemning the sinner. And I talked at length yesterday about this gospel of the adulterous woman. So I care to focus this morning more on the issue of Susanna. But today's first reading concerning Susanna is the familiar story about her who was falsely accused of misconduct by two lustful elders, judges of the law, judges of Israel at Babylon, who had unsuccessfully attempted to seduce her. In Hebrew, Susan means lily. And during her trial, the prophet Daniel, relying on God's wisdom, revealed the elders for what they were, adulterers and liars. Even though they may not have committed adultery with her in a direct, literal way, remember, by virtue of their lustful thoughts toward her, they indeed committed at least indirect adultery with her in their minds, which Jesus makes so clear in the gospel is possible to do. So during her trial, the prophet Daniel, relying on God's wisdom, revealed the elders for what they were, adulterers and liars. Through her confidence in God, we've broken down the word confidence before here, 
uh, in the Latin, con fide, with faith, being with faith. So through her confidence in God, through her having confidence or being with confidence, with faith in God, Susanna was thereby vindicated. In fact, her chief witness was God himself through the efforts of the prophet Daniel. And so today's first reading also focuses immensely on being a witness to truth, which Jesus does as well today with the teachers of the law who are surrounding the adulterous woman. We said yesterday during Sunday's homily that, you know, he gets down on the ground twice and writes with his finger, and a good number of the church fathers believe that he is writing down the sins of the very men standing around him. And that is why he says in between his two writings on the ground, when he stands back up in between the two times he does that, let the first of you who is without sin be the first to cast the stone at her. So it's also a witness to truth even in today's gospel, even though he's not letting up on the seriousness of the adulterous woman's sin. Because remember, she is guilty. So uh, a good portion of the church fathers from the first seven centuries in their writings on this gospel of the adulterous woman believe that Jesus is writing with his index finger on the ground such words as liar, adulterer yourself, wage defrauder, etc., etc., tax evader. So he's, he's confirming them and convicting them in their own sin and thus saying now, that you've seen what I've written here, those of you without sin, be the first one to cast the stone at her. But remember, at the end of today's gospel, Jesus does not make light to the woman directly that she has indeed sinned. Remember, he condemns the sin, but not the sinner. Woman, where have they all gone? Is no one here to stone you, to condemn you? No one, sir. Neither then do I condemn you, Go now and do not sin anymore. So, today's first reading and also the gospel itself is about witness to truth. A theme of today's gospel and first reading, both. We read in the Catechism of the Catholic Church in a section with a very appropriate heading which simply says, Offenses Against Truth offenses against truth, because today, again, two main themes is judging in God's presence and light, precisely so that truth may come out and reign supreme, and thus, a second theme of today's readings is witness to truth. So now I'm taking you to a part of the catechism with a heading titled, Offenses Against Truth. Offenses Against Truth things that militate against the very uh, two themes of today's readings, huh? And this is where we read about false witness, perjury, the importance of respect for others' reputations, even if they're our enemy, and the sins of rash judgment, detraction, and calumny. Uh, These are found in uh, especially numbers 2475 through number 2477 of the Catechism, what I'm about to read to you. 2475 through 2477. Offenses against truth. Christ's disciples have put on the new man created after the likeness of God in the true righteousness and holiness which he is. By putting away falsehood, they are to put away all malice and all guile and insincerity and envy and all slander. That's quoting Ephesians 4.25 and 1 Peter 2 verse 1. False witness and perjury, when it is made publicly, a statement contrary to the truth takes on particular gravity. In court, it becomes false witness. When it is under oath, it is considered perjury. Acts such as these contribute to condemnation of the innocent, exoneration of the guilty, or the increased punishment of the accused. They gravely compromise the exercise of justice and the fairness of judicial decisions. What was particularly evil about the two elders today in the first reading who lied against Susanna is that they were just that. They were elders of the law. They were two men who per se held prestige. 
They were elders of the law. They were teachers of the law. And that's what made their sin already mortal in and of itself objectively more grave, objectively more mortal, precisely because of the positions they held. Okay. Remember, a mortal sin is a mortal sin is a mortal sin. But you can have a mortal sin that is objectively more grave because of some circumstance involving the individual who carried it out. And we see that today when the two elders themselves who lied against Susanna were just that. They were elders of the law. They were teachers of the law. In other words, they knew better, huh? They knew better. So again, false witness and perjury, when it is made publicly, a statement contrary to the truth takes on a particular gravity. In court, it becomes false witness. When it is under oath, it is perjury. Acts such as these contribute to condemnation of the innocent, exoneration of the guilty, or the increased punishment of the accused. They gravely compromise the exercise of justice and the fairness of judicial decisions. Number 2477. Respect for the reputation of persons forbids every attitude and word likely to cause them unjust injury. Therefore, he becomes guilty who practices rash judgment. Okay. He becomes guilty of rash judgment, who even tacitly assumes as true, without sufficient foundation, the moral fault of a neighbor. That's the definition of rash judgment. He becomes guilty of rash judgment, who even tacitly assumes as true, without sufficient reason or foundation, the moral fault of a neighbor. He becomes guilty of detraction, who, without an objectively valid reason, discloses another's faults and failings to persons who did not know them before. That's detraction. He becomes guilty of detraction, who, without an objectively valid reason, discloses another's faults and failings to persons who did not know them before. What would be an objectively valid reason to reveal such information? Well, in a valid court, for example, especially when you are indeed under oath, you might have to indeed lawfully, under oath, reveal the fault of a person. But to just do so because, dot, 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 just because, uh, would be the sin of detraction. And then the sin of calumny or slander, which the catechism uses interchangeably, calumny or, or slander, he becomes guilty of calumny who by remarks contrary to the truth harms the reputation of others and gives occasion for false judgments concerning them. And this is especially what almost happened to Susanna today. huh? He becomes guilty of calumny or slander who by remarks contrary to the truth harms the reputation of others and gives occasion for false judgments concerning them. What a gift we have in the beautiful catechism of the Catholic Church. Recently I was at a parish mission where I quoted at length during a 45-minute conference from the catechism, and a woman approached me afterwards and she said, Father, what was the, the, uh, the, the green book you were using during that conference? I said, the catechism of the Catholic Church. And she said, no, I realize that, but what's the title of it? I said, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. <laughs> it's found at your local Catholic bookstore, okay? So what a gift we have in the Catechism. The first universal Catechism in 500 years, that is, since the Council of Trent. Huh? A wonderful compendium of sacred scripture, sacred tradition, like quoting the saints, for example, and the magisterium of the church, quoting various church documents from her various councils over the last 2,000 years. So a wonderful compendium, the Catechism of the Catholic Church of Sacred Scripture, Sacred Tradition, and the Magisterium. I wish to close now uh, with a short meditation concerning the goodness of the young prophet Daniel in today's first reading, which helped bring out the truth for Susanna. The title of this meditation is Have No Part in Death. Have No Part in Death. 
It's based on verses 45 and 46 in today's first reading from Daniel chapter 13. Verses 45 and 46, wherein we read, God stirred up the Holy Spirit of a young boy named Daniel, and he cried aloud, I will have no part in the death of this woman. What a model for young men today, huh? Think of the Saint Dominic Savio, contemporary of Saint John Bosco's, another fine young male saint in a day and age when virtue was robbed so much from young people. Think of Saint Maria Goretti in comparison with Susanna today. Maria Goretti died in 1902 because she was attacked by a young man, Alessandro Serenelli, who had no virtue. Precisely because he had no virtue. So, God stirred up the Holy Spirit of a young boy named Daniel, and he cried aloud, I will have no part in the death of this woman. Here's the meditation. May the Holy Spirit be stirred into flame so that each one of us will cry out, I will have no part in the deaths of babies in the womb. I will have no part in the deaths of the starving. I will have no part in the deaths of the victims of war. I will have no part in the deaths of the spiritually dead, but rather will help them to come back to spiritual life. Indeed, in the Holy Spirit, may we refuse to contribute to or compromise with our culture of death. In the Holy Spirit, may we attack the jaws of death, quoting Matthew 16, quickly crush Satan himself under our feet, Romans 16, and displace our culture of death with a civilization of life and love. When the young prophet Daniel refused to have a part in the death of Susanna, he brought down a corrupt judicial system and stopped a long series of sexual abuses. I want to repeat that line. It's rather important in today's day and age. Huh? When Daniel refused to have a part in the death of Susanna, he brought down a corrupt judicial system and stopped a long series of sexual abuses. By the courage and wisdom which comes from the Holy Spirit, we can rock our stuffed, foundationless culture of death and topple it. We can then permeate our culture with the gospel of life even more so in the church, where there have been grave abuses against the young in the church. By the courage and wisdom which comes from the Holy Spirit, we can rock our stuffed, foundationless culture of death and topple it. We can then permeate our culture with the gospel of life. Be a Daniel. Be a Pope John Paul II hopefully soon to be declared, be declared blessed. Be a Mother Teresa of Calcutta, already declared blessed. Be a Saint Therese of the Zoo. Be a Mary. Be a Joseph. Be a Dominic Savio. Be a Maria Goretti. Filled with the Holy Spirit, let it be done to you according to God's word, quoting Luke chapter 1. Do whatever Jesus tells you, quoting John chapter 2. Do life's little things with faith and love. Have no part in sin and death. Live the abundant life in Christ Jesus. In the risen Christ, live the victory of life. Live the abundant life in Christ. In the risen Christ, live the victory of life. Have no part in death. God bless you.